But I, I'm, I'm, it's a pity that Louise is the organizer and is not here. So should I start again? I, I now click the recording button, so it should it should record. Unless I'm, my computer's crashing, then it's your responsibility. But do wait for me because I would like to know what you think. Okay, okay. So I will go on. So what I like about the paper is also the discussion of these novel techniques that show how new applications of technological uh, um, tools can implement progresses at the theoretical level and so increase our understanding of uh, uh, mental phenomena or behavior. And I really like, and this is for me very exciting, that um, the paper is one of the few who shows how it is possible to understand or to explain features and aspects of mental phenomena by looking at the molecular and cellular level. And as uh, Anne rightly says at the beginning of the article, this is something that is uh, sometimes looked at with very much skepticism and uh, with uh, uh, reluctancy and, uh, and uh, also as kind of explanation that have bad reputation in science. Um, and I would like to say something more about this uh, reductionist uh, explanation uh, connected mind to molecules, because I think it is very important to add examples of how this kind of explanation work um, and how the downward analysis uh, um, also by looking at and focusing on the molecular level can help and can select relevant causal elements explaining features of higher, higher order phenomena. And also, I think that is completely right that reduction is explanation that directly link molecules to mind or to behavior, um, help us, allow us to refine and to feel, or at least to diminish the gap that there exists between uh, what we know or how we observe mental phenomena and uh, what we can observe or how we can manipulate uh molecules or at the at, at, at the not um lower level and uh, and this can uh, this is illustrate how this can happen with the different kind of complex system not one excluded and in this respect this research can uh, um, help to contrast to some kind of misdynamism that is uh, uh, quite widespread in uh, in philosophy, not quite widespread, but, but that is present in philosophy and maybe also in science sometimes, uh, and that doesn't regard only uh, a position. So it is not simply a position that um, claim that we cannot know by principle aspects of consciousness, but it's also uh, this mysterianism regards a cer certain strong emergentist position uh, regarding related to the mind. There are things that I like a little bit less, <laughs> or better say that I didn't really uh, capture and I think that would deserve more discussion. And these things is that I don't see a recognition of the possible limitations of explanatory reductionism. This is not because I think that one has to do everything in a single paper, but at least uh, to share or to gesture toward certain kind of limitations that explanatory reductionism has and could have. In this way, we risk, or the article may be risk to exaggerate the promises or the and the potential of new techniques or the application of these new techniques in this case escape microscopy in on factory research and uh, it, depending on how we answer the question of of, are we recognizing the limitations of explanatory re re reductionism? In relation, so depending on the answer to this question, we may deal here with uncontroversial aspects of reductionism or aspects that are not really um, are recognized or difficult to accept also from the emergentist side of science and philosophy. So let me say a little bit more about this. Things. In many passages of the article, 
and say things that are a little bit exaggerated or extreme for my point of view. Like for example, that neurobiology all of action demonstrates that any understanding of higher level mental processes must begin, so she gets normative here, with the details <laughs> of uh, cellular and molecular research. And uh, so instead of using neurobiology to test computational models, we should, so any theories I guess, of higher level processes ought to originate in molecular and cellular experimental work. So it seems that here uh, the paper is gesturing toward a kind of rigid hierarchy of what kind of work should come first and what kind of work is more explanatory than others, like disallowing pluralism about um, disciplines or approaching op approaches to produce uh, fruitful conclusions or progresses in how we understand uh, the mind or behavior. And so uh, it is not clear what extent has the eliminativism that um, the article is advocating for. It is possible to use eliminativism only when uh, in certain conditions, in certain uh, research, or it is something that we have to aim for for any phenomena at the mental level that we are that we can observe or that we want to explain. This is important because it, the article is not simply a reductionist view. It, it is claimed as a ruthless reductionist view, where my understanding of ruthless reductionism, at least for the father of it, that I think we can recognize in John Beagle, is that the molecules and the causal behavior that they show, these molecules shows, are the molecules of the cognitive or the mental phenomenon that we are observing. So it's a kind of not simply epistemic up reductionist approach, but an ontological one and maybe a metaphysical one. So I think that uh, these would also bring us to ask if there are certain aspects of uh, mental phenomena or qualitative experience that we cannot e explain through explanatory reductionism and whether explanatory reductionism, so what we are really asking to it, can we explain all the relevant aspects or the important aspect of a mental phenomenon through a complete representations or to a complete list of uh, lower order variables and entities, or should uh, should we say that some aspects are more uh, relevant than others, and we and, and then should we uh, give up to an explanation that is complete in the sense that is uh, um, uh, taking in consideration all possible causal entities that can create causal effect on the phenomenon that we are observing. In this respect, I think that it is important to uh, be clear on something that maybe I didn't get um, very well because I'm not an expert and I don't do research on factory research. This, this aspect is the following. In the, uh, and I take this example from, uh, from the article of Anne. Uh, in the, um, in the um, machine learning experiment that she quite rightly criticized for black boxing biology and especially in particular the biology of receptors, the um, correlation that have been made there work connecting the uh, sensorial experience or at least the description of the other experience, the olfactory experience with the odorant itself. While in the experiment that she is showing, she is discussing, the odorant is connected to the receptor. So we don't have any more a direct connection with the sensorial experience of the subjects. And there could be this kind of connection could um, hide a lot of variabilities that we are not able to consider in now. So um, this would uh, uh, bring us to other limits of explanatory reductionism that um, 
relate to the fact that what we can explain through reductionism normally comes from lab and control experiment through which we can observe and explain certain aspects of mental phenomena that are operationalization of the mind and not our understanding of the mind or of a qualitative experience per se. And I think this is important to, to bear in mind. Um, so if this is the case, so if we recognize these limitations and we allow that explanatory reductionism is only saying which representation that we have selected of higher order feature can be explained by which representations of lower order feature in the context of an experiment or a series of experiment, then we are dealing with uncontroversial aspects of reductionism that at least a part of new reductionists also would agree on. There are reductionists that are weak reductionists about the mind and that will never deny the usefulness of explanatory reductionism in the lab and how it can constrain or inform us about uh, um, the properties or at least the biological basis of, uh, of mental phenomenon and behaviors. So if this is the case, the things are true. Either there is a battle between emergent, emergence and reductionism that we cannot set by looking at scientific results because uh, we are uh, dealing with uh, uh, a view of reductionism and emergentism that could be different only at an extreme, but uh, they come much, much closer if we get certain uh, moderated uh, uh, understanding of explanatory reductionism uh, um, and uh, um, that is also embraced by emergentism. Or if explanatory reductionism do not recognize those limitations, I think it is actually wrong. But this is something that we can leave for discussion. And thanks for giving me the possibility to offer my thoughts. Love it. I, I thank you very much. I mean, this is this is why I had, well, was happy when I saw that you were doing that. Uh, I don't I don't know, Louise, how, how is it going to go? Does everybody shall, shall well, I respond? Yeah, so so I'm sorry for disappearing. I don't know if it was evident, but my computer for some reason never crashes, but it's the second time that it crashes on these salons. So I'm not sure exactly. So um it crashed for I am on another computer and, and link to my phone here so let's see if I stay on but so um, what I would like to do is is uh, unfortunately I couldn't follow there are a couple of things that you you, you have to um, describe right you have to address right now please go go ahead but let's try to be brief so that everyone can participate in a broader discussion which is really the goal of, of, of the salon um, I think it is because it was a little bit disturbed. Are, are you talking to me? Uh, sorry, I was talking to Anne. If Anne wants to reply to some of the points that you raised, uh, maybe perhaps briefly so that we can have a broader discussion. I'm going to try to go to another computer in one second. Okay, great. Uh, uh, so I'll, I will do a couple of things. I'm curious how, how others also uh, think about that. So um, when it comes to the recognition of uh, possible limitations, uh, that's actually a very good point. Um, there's, there's a couple of things. I should perhaps go a little bit more in terms of that link to my motivation for advocating uh, this, this approach of reductionism and why I think it's at least needed for topics like olfaction, uh, where one of my, my, my issues with, uh, sorry, my, my, my dog is kind of very needy right now, uh, but one of, one of the, the, the issues is that 
why olfaction has been neglected for such a long time and why there are so many misconceptions is because people have not been taking the material account seriously. As you say, well, does that mean, uh, isn't that still a bit strong to go like, well, we should begin uh, from top-down processing? I actually don't think it is because I don't think it ignores necessarily the, uh, the kind of more top-down or seemingly emergent issues that often have been uh, evoked in contrast to reduction. Let's say cross-cultural differences. Let's say uh, uh, certain differences in perception that are often used as this is why we can't just have, let's say, a purely reductionistic explanation. The interesting thing is, however, that uh, in smell, at least, um, a lot of the molecular explanations support the need for more, more cross-cultural studies and support the need for more, more contextual studies. So one of the things, for instance, that's often uh, been evoked with smell is the inherent subjectivity when it comes to cultural differences of liking, of not liking certain things, uh, basically, you know, uh, 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 smell is in the nose of the beholder, so to speak. But these are things that can be explained uh, partly by genetic differences of why some people don't like cilantro and some people do, uh, actually has the reason that uh, the people who don't like it have a mutation in one of the olfactory receptor genes, or also that, for instance, uh, cross-cultural differences have to do partly also with the acquisition of liking. So the more familiar we are with an odor, the threshold uh, is, is reduced as well as uh, pleasantness is increased. And these are all things that can be explained. They're not some, oh, some people are weird or something. Thing, but it is actually part of how the system works. Also, if you move somewhere different, because your yeah, receptors are constantly, uh, you've got adult neurogenesis, so you've got a um, renewal of, of, of the olfactory sensory neurons every three to four weeks. And if you move, you actually change your receptor expression pattern. Also explain the age differences and preference and sensitivities also on. So when there are certain aspects of the phenomenon usually seen as well this is why we can't just have reductionism or material explanations because there are cultural factors there 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 are certain kind of factors when it comes to um age etc in smell actually they do link to how the system is is uh, constituted on a on a material level starting with the receptors so i think this actually gives them a bit more uh, substantiation quite often especially to critics of uh, cross-cultural differences and the need for more cross-cultural integration um you also you said a couple of things so the, the, i agree with you that the lab conceptualization of mind is not the mind and that's the second thing i wanted to respond to there's of course more totally agree and that's Again, why I said, well, my issue with a lot of structure odor explanations um, and 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 the the understanding of smell that needs to be uh, kind of rethought. That being said, I am kind of a eliminativist in the sense quite often people just think eliminativism means um, well, we're just getting rid of certain levels, and you know there there are some people who think that uh, that that patchurch and tries to eliminate consciousness. That's not what this says. What this says is rather that we are still operating with an understanding of mind that's quite often pre-scientific. And rather than just trying to find studies that fit our categories, we might want to revise these categories. That can lead to their elimination. It can also lead to a change of what that means. Um, there's a really cool article by Colin Allen uh, on not defining cognition, one of my favorite papers. Uh, and he shows to what extent the notion of memory has changed by insight into bacteria, for instance, how all bacteria of memory turn into bacteria of memory and how the notion of memory itself changed through neuroscience. And and of course, the notion of memory where prior to these studies, we need to eliminate. But there are phenomena that we describe to memory that might now actually indicate a couple of several phenomena. So uh, eliminativism to me means basically rethinking the categories of mind we're operating with. I agree with you that one of the things to keep in mind is then not to fall for the same mistake and have the current conceptualization of a phenomenon, again, replacing the old one without any flexibility. And I do, I'm a fan of history, so I do think that there's a need also to sometimes keep even wrong concepts, uh, such as a, a kind of pre-scientific concept of mind, because they came from somewhere. But they shouldn't have necessarily explanatory priority. They should be heuristic, uh, if that explains uh, some, or some of my positions. Thanks, Anne. Um... So a little bit in the interest of, of time, Antonella, if that's okay, uh, before I give you one more chance to, to counter and counter, would it be okay if we, we, we let uh, a few of the questions that people already were trying to raise, that would be great to hear 
a, a broader range of voices. And so I think the first person that I, if I'm following things right here, it was, would be Dan, but do, do correct me if I'm wrong. So Dan, would you like to ask a question or make a point? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you, Anne and Antonella, for creating this wonderfully vibrant and rich dialogue. Um, I'm going to kind of cannonball into the swimming pool, kind of in between your two uh, inputs. And I want to put some pressure on something that's coming up, um, na uh, namely your labeling of your position as a reductionism, right? So what I take you to be giving in a compelling way is certainly a, um, uh, a profoundly reductive approach. But I wanted to offer maybe an alternative sort of casting of the discussion to see how much of it recovers of both your position as a ruthless reductionist and Antonella's um, um, uh, 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 well-placed criticisms or well-placed well comments. And that is, and you know that in the background, everything is leveraged by levels with me. Um, I'm, I'm tr I'll try not to hammer that too hard, but it seems to me that some, uh, it, might, it might serve your position to formulate the, 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 the primary tension not between higher level and lower level, and I can tell you why in a second, but rather between material and formal. Because the way that levels are usually cashed out in specifically neuroscience and philosophy of neuroscience, it seems to me, the things that are competing with each other are not levels per se, but rather formal models, computational models, things that are not material, and things that are full on material and empirical. And one of the, and here's the, here's the only leverage point of levels I'll throw in there. One of the things that we definitely agree on is there's a lot of, let's say stuff to say about Mars role in all of this, historically speaking. And uh, just to get the ball rolling, uh, and that'll be my cannonball splash, is what if Mars tripartite items were not levels at all? N in no way, but rather just simply modes of explanation. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I like how you left it at, at, at the really <laughs> critical, <laughs> what if, <laughs> and then I'm done. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think the next one would be Kevin, if I've got the, the right, the, the, the order correct here. Kevin, would you like to? Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Louise. And thanks, um, Anne and Antonella very much. Um, I think so I'm also going to push on the idea, I guess, the question of what reductionism means here, because it, the, the usage that you're using doesn't, doesn't align with mine at all, I have to say. And I think, um, you know, you've, you've given a really nice example of how uh, empirical results, um, you know, feed into theory, and, and that obviously goes back and forth. That doesn't, that's, to me, that's not reductionism, reductionism, that's just how biology normally works. So I don't, I don't see any major sort of metaphysical claim emerging from that and 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 the story in fact i think the particulars of the story you know you talk about it being either a reductive mechanism or an emergent one to me it's just a peripheral or or, or a more central processing and you know somewhere in there there was going to be a mechanism to explain the phenomenology of odor mixtures it happens to be at the periphery really at the periphery in the in the odorant receptors themselves it could have been at the next stage like color perception, you know, begins in retinal ganglion cells. It might have begun in cone photoreceptors themselves. I, I don't see that anything follows from that. There was good, there's some mechanism um, and, and the mechanism doesn't explain smell, right? It, that's not what's been explained here. What's been explained is there's some difference in the perception when you have a mixture versus something else. So the mixture has to be perceived somehow and the perception happens to be in the odorant receptors. That, that's fine. I, I don't see anything following from that. And I, and I don't see that the allosteri of odorant receptors gives a full reductive explanation of smell. It, it, it may explain that particular instance or, you know, that, that particular factor or feature um, of smell. It may be, actually, it doesn't even explain that. It's just the mechanism whereby, um, whereby that happens. So, um, yeah, I, 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 it does, to me, it doesn't feel like um, there should be any commitment to theoretical reductionism or eliminative reductionism coming from the story that you've told. It's just an example of 
very successful methodological reductionism. It's the reason why people do empirical experiments and then use that to inform theory. So I, I'm baffled, I have to say, by the, the sort of sweeping metaphysical claim for for, for There was no metaphysics. There was no metaphysics, but I'll, I'll have a couple of responses. Well, that's that's fine. That's all I wanted to say. Is that I, I just don't get the, I just don't get the the, the extrapolation. From go ahead, the, Anne, go ahead. From the details. Uh, we didn't hear can, you. I, can, can I answer now, or shall I wait for for Clark to? No, do no, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead, because you okay. really need to answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Clark. Um, but so one thing is when you said, well, your uh, conceptualization of reductionism doesn't align with mine. Clearly. Um, so one reason why what I have an issue with is that a lot of the criticisms of reductionism I read, it's like, well, why shouldn't the notion of reductionism not change? like with many other things. So why should it explicitly reductionism that is always framed in this kind of Putnam open uh, uh, style? Why, why shouldn't we rethink that too? I didn't say that this particular mechanism explains smell. Um, that is in fact, uh, at the end of the paper I actually highlight, there are a couple of other things involved as well. And I'm not saying there aren't any kind of top-down processes. Uh, there are. It is, however, an explanation of smell that's been often seen on a different and sorry Dan level of of uh, of both when it comes to the brain and uh, as well as uh, whether it can be explained by certain material interaction or whatever is going on because quite often it's been being used as an example of subjectivity as a smell not being accountable by either mechanism or uh, some kind of material basis or stimulus but that smell is just accountable by its own experience which which is the kind of original uh, definition of subjectivity. You say, um, well, it doesn't explain smell. It does explain smell as a perceptual experience. So that brings me a little bit back to some of the earlier criticisms because there have been also behavioral experiments. One of the interesting uh, part of that SCAPE study is that it is linked also to behavioral studies, both when it comes to how the mice actually reacted uh, to these mixtures, as well as we did a, a couple of uh, human uh, uh, experiments as well, to what extent um, basically people could or could not discriminate them, etc. So there is a behavioral element. I know behavior is not perception either, but that is just a general uh, issue we, we always face in neuroscience, how we're linked to these things. I agree that there's a question about to what extent we talk about peripheral and central mechanisms. Um, what the point was for me with this particular uh, reductionism, and if you say that's just how biology works, wonderful. If you if you want reductionism to just go down to let's say the the kind of Putnam style of down to the atoms, down to the kind of elemental elements, that's also a reductionism I with you uh, agree with. Like that's kind of unfeasible. That's not how it works. Um, for me, the interesting is more to what extent. How do we determine what the central and fundamental elements are? And I don't think we can have uh, the role of fundamental elements regardless of the phenomenon we're trying to explain. And if you don't like to see that as reductionism, so that's not, you know, how then we just agree, uh, then we agree on the phenomenon and how we should study it. We just label it by different things. So you might say, for me, that's not reductionism. For me, that's actually a central part of reductionism. You would say, why? Uh, one of the reasons is uh, that quite often I do see right now a tendency, uh, and this is why I brought the quotes in the beginning, to separate mind and molecular explanations. And this is, I do think, one of the reasons why people suddenly go and jump on board with things like panpsychism again, which has become a strong, uh, kind of a strong topic. Also, and this brings it back to, to, to uh, uh, Antonella's point, perhaps in 10, 20 years, I do think we need to go away again with, from production explanations. I see this more as a, dial a dialectical thing, actually, kind of a historical development of what explanation or kind of drive is needed at a certain time. Uh, so I think, for instance, that John Dupre's argument against reductionism were absolutely fundamental in the 1990s. I think right now we need to go back and insert a little bit of reductionism again. I think at some point it might be too much again, and we not kind of need to. So this is, I personally do think that explanations are better grounded in the material level, but I also know that the way in which science works in terms of historically and what we're emphasizing and what the limits and of our questions are, that's going to change. They are kind of a dialectical person where, where whatever is a good explanatory strategy for now, but I do think we need to kind of 
reinsert reductions in here and there for the reasons mentioned. But I agree with you, if you don't like to call it reductionism, I'm not, I'm not wedded to having an ism necessarily, but uh, the reason for me to, to keep with the reductions program is because it, it, it helps to avoid a lot of misconceptualizations, uh, at least in smell. I think we can, I mean, this is, I actually want to jump in and I, I'm sure Kevin wants to, I, but we can continue with this for, 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 for a little while, uh, in, in a little while, but I would like to give a chance to Clark and then Brady. Uh, Clark, do you want to, do you want to make your point? Sure. Uh, thanks. That was a lovely talk. Um, I'm a little bit probably le le less naive on the topic or more naive on the topic rather, but uh, John Searle used to make this distinction between uh, the brain being causally reducible or the mind being causally reducible to the brain and the mind being ontologically reducible to the brain um, such that mental states are going to have qualities like being true or false or the angst of post-industrialized capitalism that like molecules won't. Um, I'm just wondering if this distinction might um, save us from any problems that philosophy is currently in when people argue about these things. Um, can you can you specify a little bit more? Because I'm I'm not sure I fully follow. Just not to misunderstand you. Yeah, no. He was was saying that the mind is clear, probably pretty clearly causably reducible to the brain, but not ontologically reducible to the brain, such that mental states will have qualities like being true or false, like that that the obviously the molecular properties won't have. Um, I just feel like people are kind of prevaricate around this distinction sometimes when talking about reductionism, and I'm not sure what the current state of that in philosophy is. I think I'm trying to avoid the issue of, of truthful mental states, partly because I think this is a, a, an issue that doesn't apply well to smell, where you can have actually the same, same external inputs, but different um, basically mental expressions of it, especially with odorants. So you and I are going to experience sometimes the same odorant differently, as well as you yourself, same odorant in a different context, will have a different perceptual image. And that's actually not a problem. That's not a bug, but a feature of the system, because the thing with many odorants is that they're promiscuous. They occur in different chemical contexts. So, and also there's, there's more than one perceptual quality. It's not like uh, with color that you see red, but you don't see blue. But with many odorants, you have more than one qualitative node involved with an odorant. If if uh, so, that this is where the truthful representation. I'm not sure what that would mean, for instance, with smell. This is why I'm avoiding the kind of you've got a truthful or not truthful mental state. Um, perhaps as a as a quick example is, and that was an example actually by Christophe Lodamiel, uh, the perfume I mentioned a couple of times. He gave people a smelling strip. Uh, kind of dipped in sulfuryl. And if I just say sulfur, you might go, okay, what does it smell like? And people of course didn't know what it smelled like. So it was kind of fatty, organic, sweet, not quite sure whether you like it or not. I mean, I was like, I actually quite don't know. It, it could go either way. And then he showed an image of warm milk and you could hear the audience going, of course it's warm milk. How could I have not you know, learned this before? Then he switched the image to ham. And suddenly the milk was gone, I kid you not, it was ham in your mind. And he went back and forth and back and forth. He could have also, it's not so simply like the rabbit duck is salt switch. He could have done beans because the thing is that sulfur is part of different things. And um, this kind of ambiguity or seeming ambiguity is quite crucial to smell to allow for flexible behavior of organisms uh, in response to odorants in different contexts where they have a different behavior for it. So I am actually quite fond, for instance, uh, despite my very neurocentric approach to things, uh, but the brain is part of the body when it comes to uh, embodiment or actually for E in general. I, I just think that this helps us to rethink the brain rather than, than, than necessarily kind of debrain the body, so to speak. And that's why I also don't like to talk too much about uh, veridical representations of the world because that, again, it excludes a lot of things that I don't think are necessarily the primary explanatory target. Right, Antonella, did you uh, want to comment? Because I thought in the beginning you were, uh, you, want make, you want to make a comment? Um, yes, I will make a comment on these aspects of uh, uh, reductionist explanation and also on the answer that uh, you gave Anne at the beginning about eliminativism. 
and uh, uh, also the recognition or not recognition of the variability or the complexity and the limitations of explanatory reductionism. So one aspect that um, I think could be confusing is to call reductionism something that it is also recognized by emergentists or at least weak emergentists, right? And I'll tell you why. So it, from on the one hand, you seems to embrace mechanicist view of explanation, um, but to be also eliminativist in respect to when we don't need intermediate levels. And I tend to go for, so for this proposal in the sense that I think it is important also to not to be constrained, at least in principle, uh, by too much theorizing about levels to how we have to construct an explanation. And we have to be guided more by empirical research. But at the same time, if the downward analysis is the only aspect that we can attribute to reductionism, then I don't see why we have to count this reductionism, ruthless reductionism, where what we are in the identifying at the lower level, so define what is happening at the higher level. Um, and also, um, I will never bet something more in principle about how we can investigate the variability of a higher level phenomenon and where we are going to find uh, causal relevant aspect to explain this variability. You, for example, were talking of cultural differences in other perception and how these cultural differences or um, differences in the definition of other, other experience could claim or um, push us more toward black boxing biology in, in olfactory research. And at the same time, I think it is completely possible that at a certain point, what we want to explain at the uh, phenomenolog phenomenological level, at the exper uh, ex experiential level, will not be reducible to what is happening at the receptor level, but would depend on some contextual aspect that is outside the receptors and that is maybe belonging or lying on other levels regarding brain, regarding neurotransmitters, regarding also environmental context or the developmental history of the, the organism. In this respect, I don't know if this is the case regarding olfactory research, but it is also true that what we said before uh, is that olfactory research is quite new and it is very often a perspective error to think that when we zoom in a phenomenon, we can explain and link back what we are observing and the changes we are observing to the behavior or the causal behavior of a couple of entities. And then at a certain point, we always need to zoom out, you say, and to include more contextual aspects of different scales of different orders. You say that this is a dialectic of science. As a researcher in philosophy, I will say, I will not reinvent the wheel and I will make some effort, not simply for you, for all of us, to reshape also the terms and the concept that we use to convey the complexity, both of the research that neuroscience does and of the uh, categories that we use to describe that. Um, just as a, as a, as a quick uh, clarification, I don't say that everything is going to be a receptor mechanism. And that's what I also said at the end of the article. And actually, I look uh, at, so to speak, uh, more central processing, higher level, whatever you want to call it. Actually, in the book, one of the things where uh, what, what I do highlight is, for instance, that smell is a fantastic model to give some kind of material basis to theories of predictive coding. Um, shaped in the kind of Helmholtz understanding of ideomotor theory. So I'm not saying like everything in smell is receptor levels, uh, but it is uh, the key part to understand what is actually being processed further. And this is the, it's, it's not just simply an interface which we can reduce to the stimulus 
model independently and in isolation to the organism. So this is this is for me the crucial bit um, to, to, to highlight. And when I say, for instance, well, uh, the, the cross-cultural aspects, the point would be, uh, my point is to say that a lot of the things why, for instance, cross-cultural uh, aspects of smell have been neglected um, that, that basically receptor states as well as also a better understanding of central processing mechanisms will support the need for more cross-cultural studies because this is, doesn't come out of nowhere is really how the system works to so take actually these distinction a bit more seriously um, and that there are these differences that they make they make they, they matter to the system and they're made based by, by the materials so just just to clarify that point that i'm actually not saying oh no 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 we can um, reduce everything to the receptor sheet uh, or and and basically other mechanisms are unimportant no that's not what i'm saying um it's much more in terms of, okay, what is being how encoded where, what are the elements? And that depends on the phenomenon and function we're trying to explain. And that certain things that, for instance, differences in phenomenological experience, um, not to get rid of phenomenology as a method, for instance, and to actually take these variations that we do experience seriously and look at like, how does the system then create that? So it's not to get rid of that, but to be also aware of and precisely to actually bring back your point that our understanding of mind need not be what the mind is. And that is an issue with smell. If you think about introspection of our experience of smell, well, that would basically exclude retronasal olfaction. So we would not know that uh, retronasal olfaction is small rather than, well, we experience this taste in terms of oral, uh, oral referrals. So there are a couple of things to which extent, for instance, are interesting questions, when and how does sometimes our experience of the things diverge from the physiological explanations and how can, how can a better understanding of physiology tell us more actually about what perception is and how sometimes phenomenology has an experience and an expression that needs to be rethought in terms of what's the content, what's the, the, the behavioral forms, all these kind of things. Just, just, just. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, the, the, I was lost. Okay, I should I should hear now. Sorry, my, sometimes my headphones do kind of a fun little thing. Okay, so I think that you you finish your point, right, Anne? Yeah. Okay, so like let me give a chance to Brady. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so let me chance give a chance to Brady to ask his question or or make the com make a comment. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so I'm new here. I'm Brady Williamson, a uh, faculty at uh, University of Cincinnati, uh, same as Tony Chimero. Uh, I'm in the Department of Radiology. My background is uh, neuroimaging, uh, and I tend to call myself maybe the most skeptical neuroimaging scientist you know, <laughs> possible, because I, the reason I'm so drawn to it is because I'm so skeptical of many of uh, the aspects of it. So uh, that's kind of my background. I'm newer to philosophy. I've always been interested in it. I ended up getting you know, a degree in experimental psychology from Cincinnati, but this is an avenue uh, where I could easily see in a different life, you know, I would have taken instead. So I asked Tony how to get involved and he sent me the link to this and it's really a, a blessing because this is a fantastic conversation and uh, I definitely appreciate uh, all the time spent here. So sorry, just a little brief background to uh, introduce myself. So uh, yeah, so it was a, a super interesting talk. Uh, I, will, I will say firsthand that I, my bias is more towards the, the neuroscience, neuroanatomy rather than the philosophy. So my questions will largely be based on that. Uh, but I do think olfaction is uh, a perfect system, you know, the best system to, to study uh, this kind of uh, what I would call, you know, mechanistic scaling. Uh, so, so for example, uh, since it's the only sense without telemic relay, right? So it's the only sense with direct connections to cortex uh, without going through the thalamus. Uh, and uh, we know that it's, since it's connected to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex directly, uh, that that has strong connections to like basal ganglia, uh, dopaminergic kind of systems, uh, which have a lot of uh, allosteric, you know, mechanisms in it. So I'm not super surprised to see, you know, allosteric uh, kind of modulation uh, in the like actual sensory sheet. Uh, but my, so my question is, is there anything in the literature or anything that's been done uh, where you see this 
this interesting 30% enhancement, 30% suppression kind of pattern uh, that occurs higher up, maybe in prefrontal cortex. Like how does that scale to the biology uh, past the sensory sheet? Um, can you go, uh, how does it scale? And then it was shortly interrupted. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no worries. Uh, so how does, how does that kind of, is there anything in literature that shows that that 30% suppression and 30% enhancement scales past the sensory sheet to like, uh, for example, prefrontal cortex? Uh, yeah. So there is a lot of inhibition further up in the system. Um, I'm not aware of necessarily a study doing like, this is like it's retained in the same amount, uh, partly because I mean, the, this, the, the, the SCAPE study was published only in 2020. Um, so follow up, but there are a, a lot of studies showing to what extent there is a lot of inhibition already at the bulb level. There's a lot of feedback, for instance, also when it when it comes to um, from the from the piriform cortex back to the bulb, uh, as well as there are some indications also that there is uh, feedback also from the bulb to the periphery. So there's a lot of things going on. Um, there is a lot of so this is when when you said for instance where it seems to be a nice system uh, precisely for bypassing the thalamus. That was also something that uh, Ramoni Cajal, for instance, highlighted, like two synapses straight into the, 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 the core cortex, so to speak. This should be simple. What well, turns out, of course, uh, that if you talk to a lot of people who work on the bulb, the devil's in the details. So what people are getting more and more interested in are precisely, for instance, the effect uh, and the role of interneurons when it comes to different, different inhibitory processes that give kind of smell much more of a temporal signature in addition to the focus on spatial representation, there's a lot more to be done because there's actually shit tons of different interneurons and there's, uh, this is something that's currently being done. And what there's a lot of things in development because in addition to having uh, a lot of kind of uh, processing just within the bulb, which is kind of like, I, I know that people don't like that comparison. I just say like, like a supercomputer without necessarily being stuck to that metaphor, but um, that, there is something going on when it comes to um, inhibition a lot, which differentiates further, for instance, uh, bet between, let's say, similar signals. So it's not just simply at the, at the periphery, there's disc discrimination between mixtures, but also the kind of contextual variation of having the same mixture or the, the same stimulus in different contexts, having different things. So the 30%, I, I'm not sh I, I would need to check whether anybody has a percentage of that but uh, it's definitely retained, uh, maintained higher up. Interesting. For yeah, lack of a... better words. I'm, I'm still sticking to, unfortunately, a higher up level. I mean, I know this, we, we talked about this, but for, for, for lack of better words right now. So I agree yeah, with Antonella, we need to find language. Yeah, it's, it's super helpful. I, I, I guess the, my, my thinking, uh, I don't know, it's probably gonna sound super naive since I'm, I'm new to philosophy, but I consider myself kind of a, uh, uh, a reductionist in the sense that the nonlinear relationships between levels scale from top to bottom, right? So that's kind of like my own perspective. Instead of saying like uh, reductionist down to the molecule, like those relationships between molecules, kind of what you were saying, scale from sensory sheet up to higher level cortex, right? So that's that's kind of what I was thinking along those lines. So. Uh, Kevin, yeah. would you? Oh, sorry, Anne, would you, when you go? I just said fair enough. I just fa said fair enough. That was all. Yeah. Kevin, Thanks. would you? Want yeah, to... I don't want to jump in again if anyone else wants to, because I've had a chance already, but I didn't see any other hands up. It's okay. Okay, okay great. Um, well, a couple of points. One, I, um, it's funny, um, Brady's question there on the Alistairy and, and, you know, the other levels involved in alpha action just prompted a few thoughts. First of all, you know, your response there, and and also highlighted all the higher order uh, aspects that, that go on in olfactory processing, which can't be explained in a, in a reductive way. So I think that it undermines the point of, of ruthless reductionism in, in a sense. Um, secondly, the, the allosteria itself, um, coming from an axon guidance 
point of view, how, how axons sniff their way, growing nerves sniff their way around through the embryo. Uh, we always had a very um, simplistic kind of idea where, you know, an individual receptor binds to an individual ligand and that makes it either attractive or repulsive. And then over time, it turns out, well, actually it's all really combinatorial and, and the, the context really matters. And that context includes allosteric interactions between receptors that change the, the tone and everything. To me, that's really holistic, actually. So that that that's really non-reductive, uh, even at the molecular level. It's a much more holistic view of the way the system works because it's it's saying all of those components work together, even in a single cell, uh, and that's how the and that's how the system works. So um, that's just a point. But the the other one, which is a broader one, is I guess um, a question of what it is we're trying to explain in any. In any circumstance. And I think a lot of times we look at for a reductionist explanation of a difference in how a system works or a difference in the perception that you get. And, and you can look down and say, well, look, the, the different, the mechanism for finding that difference starts here. It starts with the receptors or it starts with these cells or, or whatever it is. And then you'll say, we've explained X, but you really just explained a difference in X. You haven't explained the whole thing. Uh, with a reductive explanation. You have a reductive explanation for the beginning of the mechanism for why it's different in this circumstances versus that one. And you can see that in, in genetics, for example, it's a mistake that people make where, you know, there's a FOXP2 mutation causes a, a difference in language. That's not, it doesn't mean that's a gene for language and it doesn't mean that that gene by itself explains language. So you don't get a reductive explanation for, for the capacity for language. You get a reductive explanation for the difference that happens in those people. And I think for me, that's partly what is, is going on here and that you're looking for a reductive explanation for odor discrimination. Why, why does a mixture smell different from other, everything else? It doesn't give an explanation for the whole thing. And it, and it doesn't, for me, argue that reductionism is the way to get to an explanation for smell or any other cognitive experience. Can I respond to that? And can I, can I, can I just say one thing very briefly? Um, so maybe to cont contextualize a little bit, I think a little bit of the, the, the trouble that some of us are having with reading your version of reductionism, so maybe to put it in a broader perspective, is that you're bringing it to some to the search of some critical parts that have these, these, these effects that are... So what are this? If, if anyone is going to have an explanation emergence emergentist or or not it has to start with some kind of parts that are fundamental to the system and you're saying that in 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 in, in olfaction those hadn't been found properly because they were leveled at the receptor so i think the confusion that we're having is that you're demonstrating quite clearly that we were we we shouldn't be looking at the molecular level of the odorants themselves we should be looking at, at, at really at the receptor structure and how they, these two, the, the, obviously the molecular, because they're the things that we smell and, the, and the, how the, 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 the receptors actually react to them is really the fundamental aspect that, that is novel here. But I don't think that we, we're we would be disagreeing with that, that you're finding some critical parts that we want to bootstrap across multiple levels in many different ways with feedback, with nonlinear things, with emergent related things that you rightly sometimes mention here as, as ill-defined. So I think that we're having a problem in, in, in your statement that this is a strongly or ruthless reductionism because you didn't take something that was all the way at, at perhaps at the perceptual level and, 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 and got rid of all the levels and you boil it down to that final level of the receptors. So I don't know if that so, confuses so, so issues more or not, but that's a little bit my take of the confusion at least. Well, this is actually, I think, the, the main confusion in terms of that. For some reason, I don't agree with the fact that Bruce's reduction has to say everything is at the receptor level. That's not what I said, and that's not what I think is going on here, because as, as Kevin rightly said, this is a much more uh, holistic level in terms of that there are other processes involved that also, by the way, feed back into the receptor level. So the the commitment that Ruthless reductions has to be receptors, I just don't see why this has why reductions has to be defined like that. So this is where it comes back to our difference in terms of what we understand as reductionism. Where so like I I don't agree, for instance, with the with the Putnam uh, Oppenheim 
kind of hierarchy of levels and that reduction is actually means to these kind of ontological fundamental parts. No, what are these parts? Is the term employee basically the methods and technologies to carve out what are the kind of moving bits, what are the kind of more fundamental bits for a particular function? So if if that's for some people not reductionism, fine with me actually i'm trying to understand the phenomenon why it is reductionism for me is because we are even even the so-called higher levels are uh, interactive levels on a molecular bit that isn't suddenly something detached from the materials uh, so even also when we when we look for instance at let's say the olfactory bulb a lot of things there need to be looked at the molecular level when it comes to for instance the quest of is this stereotypic organization or not turns out it is not it's actually a developmentally induced structure uh, uh, but these are all then things that go back to a molecular explanation. And that's for me the reductionist bit. Um, that also excludes, uh, that does not exclude, sorry, that also does not exclude, for instance, uh, relational aspects uh, when it comes to a form of better situated ecological understanding of, uh, of the brain. That I don't think that excludes it. I think rather that we need to, uh, and I, I see why some people have an issue with that notion of reductionism because it doesn't go with kind of traditional notions of reductionism. But I think we do need to change our attitude towards what reductionism is in light also of the, the uh, techniques we do employ. Um, and there's less disagreement also with, for instance, people have a much more kind of, okay, this is about complexity, functionality, et cetera. I agree. Uh, this is why I highlighted, for instance, also John's criticisms. Uh, so John Dupre's criticism of reductions in the beginning. So I do think they have an absolute point. He's right. That being said, I don't think this is ex excludes reductions. It just means we have to rethink it, so to speak. Okay. Uh, are there any other other points that? Um, oh, that Dan. Uh, just to chime in real quick to go back to my original comment. I I, I mean. There's clearly a lot of stuff on the table at the moment and a lot of interests and a lot of uh, sort of parsings about how to talk about this stuff. But I'm wondering, you know, I, I don't mean to be pedantic about this, but I mean, when, you, when, you're, when you're trying Go to- Go for it. Go for it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to be, I, I hope it's useful, not pedantic. Um, why are you wed to this ism language? Because when, when, when I hear an ism from someone, that entails to me a type of gr greater commitment to something, right? When I hear it, it's not just reductive and it's not just a successful reduction, but rather it's a reduction ism, I'm committed to, this is the way I understand the ism part, I'm committed to excluding entire ways of thinking about this, right? So I'm just wondering, um, do you think it would be better served just by cleaning up a little bit of the language? That you can apply to every position. I mean, it is in activism. Uh, so uh, just to say like every position at some point has an ism. If you prefer me not to use the ism, fine with me. Um, but I mean, it's, 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 uh, I see the issue of like ism and exclusion of other positions, but that is an issue you can apply to every kind of position, whether it's no, an but, activism but or, but and, and is that's that's not completely fair, right? A lot of people try to stay away with the ism for exactly those reasons, reasons, right? So Evan Thompson, every time someone talks about inactivism on Twitter, he says, you know, we really prefer the the, the inactive approach and and framework and whatnot. You could say it's completely semantic or it's silly, no, but I think it's really fundamental because I think I think Dan is right. I think because when looking at what Dan is saying and Kevin is saying to me. To me, it feels like your explanation is, is something that you're making it clear that we have to understand olfaction in this multi-level, across levels, and, and we, we really need to pay attention to some really low levels. So it's, to me, it's much more about levels to a, neuro, a standard neuroscientific type of understanding is that you're drawing, you're drawing upon levels very heavily, and, but then you are, your language is less levels it's, it's this reduction reductionism. So I think that's the confusion that a lot of think of people are having here, and I, I'm sure your readers in general. Antonella, please. Yeah, uh, along this line, I think um, 
what we are discussing here about uh, end paper also belong to a general so it is a general problem of the philosophy of mechanisms nowadays and a lot of philosophy of neuroscience nowadays just as an example and maybe an, an anecdote of this confusion can come from the uh, observation that explanatory reductionism is listed in uh, reductionist positions in terms of mechanistic explanation and at the same time in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and at the same time it is listed as a weak emergentist position in the emergentist voice. So this kind of uh, uh, non-clarity about what reductionism is and what kind of emergentism, uh, at least weak emergentism entails, is spanning across different disciplines or sub-disciplines of neuroscience, at least what I know more, and is spanning also across of different debates that uh, regard uh, uh, the ontology of reality and uh, the kind of explanation that we use uh, for describing or giving sense to scientific work. So I completely agree on the fact that a downward analysis is useful and to counteract contrast to this position toward or against anyone that is skeptical about uh, how it is important to look at the em em empirical facts and also to change or to develop a new theoretical or empirical framework to discover or investigate uh, the mind in all its aspects. I think there is very really no limitation on what we can investigate empirically. At the same time, I go with uh, Louis' observation that it is detrimental maybe also for your research, which is so interesting, so well done, so intriguing, to open um, a paper with a strong statement on ruthless, ruthless reductionism if it doesn't mean to, meant to be that, because it can um, confuse what you're really claiming and uh, consider considering uh, productive of uh, the research that you are describing. Um, so I mean, it's a it's a it's a good point, but it was not chosen without intent. Actually, the 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 notion of ruthless uh, reductionism, because one of the the key things, and that is something that's uh, also of course emerging in some of uh, John Bigel's later chapter, is that rather than trying to find, for instance, I mean the the the, the laser drugs paper, I found was a really helpful paper where he showed to what extent ruthless reductionism really means to look at the explanations on the molecular level. That does not mean just on the periphery. So bring it back to we're kind of quite often uh, conflating uh, periphery to central processing with uh, molecular explanations and higher up. These are these are these are two things, and sometimes they coincide, sometimes not. Um, the the other thing is so you said like it is confusing, and I I see that because it's happening. It is confusing to call it reductionism, contrary to what's been called before. That being said. Uh, I still don't see why we can't change the definition of reductionism in light of trying to understand what we do with it as an explanatory method. We did that with pluralism, which has so many different variations. I mean, there are more positions of what scientific pluralism is than potentially people there. Uh, they're, they're defending it. And I do think there's a need to redefine what we mean by reductionism and not stick to specific kind of i see that this can lead to a confusion but i don't see why what can't i mean quite often through this kind of divergence of what we understand by it and somebody saying we could also understand it another another way we're actually having this discussion so i see why you say it's confusing but i do think this kind of confusion stems from the fact that for some reason we're not often adopting the attitude that reductionism is not fixed in stone either. I do think it is something we can debate about further, what it means, uh, whether we adopt an ism or not. I mean, point taken, if you like reductive more. But um, I think one of my, my issues is perhaps from a broader position. And I agree that this is A, not in the paper, and B, um, I have to think about it further because my issue with just linking it to particular causal structures without saying there is a certain uh, like reduction at stake here is to think of something, let's say, property dualism, which goes like, oh, yeah, there's clearly some kind of causal link. But then we're still having these these 
uh, issues of mental phenomena somehow detached from the material. Um, and that is an issue that kind of plays into my motivation for saying, let's call this reductionism for now, because it is the matter, it is not some kind of property dualism, which is still floating around to, to explain perceptual experiences. And that's not to say not to take the phenomenology phenomenological, I think I say that word, uh, level seriously or not introspection seriously, but not to detach it from the material explanation. And this is why I said like not to not to say, oh, everything has to be receptor level in order to be reduction. Uh, perhaps it explains a bit more what my motivation behind here is. It makes a lot of sense. I think that I think that writing about the way the term is used and how you're proposing to use it, I think it would be very useful for, for the field in general. If you want to, to continue expanding this line of, of, of argumentation, I think it would be really important. Uh, but I'll let uh, others, uh, I, I've lost a little bit of track of the order. So please just go ahead if you think that you're next. Uh, I don't know if it was Brady. Uh, I just, I don't know. I'm a lot, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, ahead, I, yeah, sure, I'll go ahead. Uh, so I think the point that uh, that I was confused about as kind of a newcomer to this was uh, that reductionism seems to be able to be defined by the functional unit that's defined when you're speaking in the paradigm that you're talking about. So for example, uh, it seems like the functional unit doesn't necessarily like, to me, reductionism means the reduction down to the most basic fundamental unit of the system, right? So, and that doesn't necessarily mean uh, the molecule, right? That could mean the interaction between, I think that was kind of Kevin's point what he was making is that uh, the fundamental unit, the kind of holistic unit uh, could be the fun like the actual fundamental functional unit of the system. So for example, you can, you can reduce the problem down to the molecule, right? Uh, but that molecule on its own doesn't really mean anything functionally to the system, right? So the actual like useful reduction is down to the functional unit, which would be the interaction between the sensors or, and the molecules in this instance, right? So, uh, so I guess I'm a little confused on uh, what what ground reductionism stands on, uh, if it can be manipulated by how you define the basic fundamental unit is. If, hopefully, that makes sense. I, I would you mind if I share the screen very quickly again because I think oh, I, sure. can, I can I can show it then perhaps. Um... Let me, sorry, just do this one more time again. Uh, okay, so one thing is what you just mentioned. I, I actually thank you for the question because I think this is what, what most of the uh, pushback I got is often uh, where I do seem to have a different understanding. And uh, sorry, it takes a while. So this is basically the, um, the issue that often people have when it comes to the ontological hierarchy of elements that is given independently of the technology. And I don't think it is independently of the, the, the function we're trying to address as well as the technology with which we're addressing that. And there is a really good paper by Eric Hochheim on, on precisely the, uh, the, the issue of how to rethink this kind of Putnam uh, Oppenheimer uh, levels hierarchy ontology given and then we're just working around that. For me, the reductionism where I say like, what do I mean by rethinking the causal elements? Sorry. Now the melody of jeopardy is um, to to already go like well, perhaps for instance. So previously we have the the interaction between we've got the primary causal element of the molecules in interaction with uh, with with at some point the receptor, and. If we look actually at the round, first of all, we're talk we're not having like uh, molecules in kind of clouds of molecules that where a molecule reacts with a receptor and receptor population. Sometimes we've got the neurons, where we've got the higher level computational mechanism until we get perception. But rather to go like, well, perhaps we should actually start, first of all, we should uh, look at as the stimulus, not as individual odorants, but as clouds of odorants. That's already kind of a change, which by the way, makes a much more stronger case for ecological perception, because we do perceive clouds of molecules in different statistical frequencies in the environment. So if we already start out with a different of, of whoops, sorry, the clouds of molecules, but also that means we need to, as the kind of key element here, not just like, okay, odorants, receptors, uh, etc., but rather we've got receptor populations as the thing to think about. So it's not the individual receptors. We already need to start about receptor populations as the fundamental element. Uh, so how do we single out things determines uh, basically what the level of explanation is. And I'm sorry, Dan, for using levels so often here, but 
I'll, I'll go for it right now. So that in that context, well, sorry, my, my, my computer is kind of weird. Um, and from that, actually, we have to model the receptor. So not the receptor and the receptor population, but the other way around, because that allows us to actually do eliminate some of the kind of seemingly additional mechanism, which we only need because we've got this additive understanding of, of interaction. Um, Okay, so this is this is what I mean, for instance, with with these kind of elements and why I want to go away from the traditional notion of reductionism that has these ontological hierarchies of elements independently of even the thing we're trying to explain, but rather, okay, we want to understand this, we can currently understand with that, what are the elements we need in order to understand that and at some point, it might also be that, for instance, uh, especially with spells, since there are a lot of moving pieces, that we have to, with further technology, with further understanding, also reshuffle that understanding. So this is this is not necessarily that. This is just part of the model. It's a theoretical model built on our current understanding of the materials. That might change, yes. Um, but it just shows to what extent guidance by the kind of key or kind of pre-given elements is, is the, the key thing I'm trying to attack here. Can I add something on this, Luis? Let me just mention one thing. The meeting is supposed to finish at two on the on the on the Zoom site. I don't know if it crashes when. I don't think I can extend it. So if it crashes at two, uh, it's not that I was angry at anyone. <laughs> it's just that I defined <laughs> it as a two-hour meeting. <laughs> Oh, but I don't know uh, if it stops. Uh, it, sh it should continue, but two things. Uh, First okay. of all, I, I, I'm going to send you a link to the second recording because when you crash right, the recording, right. no, stop. I, I don't want to stop the discussion. I just wanted to mention yeah. that if it crashes at two, I just wanted people to know. <laughs> but Fair maybe enough. it won't like, crash. I don't know. Yes, yeah, I, I hope, I hope please, not. Please go ahead. I, I wanted to add just a short follow up and then uh, I think I will stop challenging you on the reductionist. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so um i think there are two reasons at least two reasons for why you cannot do this uh, reconceptualization of uh, reductionism that you are aiming at and these are uh the historical fact that reductionism is linked to two principal concept or core concept one is the um complete description that we can at least in principle do of higher order, higher scale phenomena, and um, the prediction that we can do by of higher order phenomena by looking at lower level ones. So the first one is not even in principle possible because in order to be to offer a complete description, at least in principle, of a phenomena, you have to decide where a mechanism begins or a mechanistic process and where it ends. And this is not possible because of the fundamental role of the environment in almost any biological process. And the second one, and this makes reductionism uh, be always looked uh, with skepticism if we ask to it too much. So if we don't take it as a pragmatic explanatory tool. Um, and the second one is prediction. And it's also uh, another point that would create this, that creates these reluctances and this bad reputation of re uh, reductionism if we ask to reductionism too much. So the fact that we cannot predict what is happening at the higher scale if we look at what is happening at the order scale, a lower order scale. So we never can be sure, and for many reasons, contextual effects, modulation, possibly also multiple realizability of what is happening there if we know what is happening down uh, in the in the analysis because of this attached core that uh, and theoretical principle of reductionism i think it is almost impossible to reshape completely what we ask from reductionism and the only we think that we can do with it is listing this is just my opinion listing what kind of systems or what kind of changes we can explain in a reductive way um, and 
always talk of a pragmatic take of it. So just that's that. actually that's actually two quite interesting points. So when yeah, you thank you, that was great. Yeah. So uh, because when you say in the beginning, we can't have a fully determinate view of the system. Agree. I don't actually think this is a uh, necessary part of reductionism. So this is again where where we, where we diverge because the thing is, um, you're kind of subscribing a very strong metaphysical view to reductionism. These some reductionists do have that strong metaphysical view, not not going around that. I don't see why you can't have a more pragmatist approach. I mean, the thing is, uh, this is where I do kind of still agree. For instance, also with John Dupree in terms of well. Let's really look at a, at a pragmatic context in which we're modeling. That being said, I do think there's a very strong case to be made for, for reductionism on both the understanding of like methodology and explanation, but also in terms of to rethink ontology, because I do not think that ontology is strictly a given. So this is where I, I don't I don't see why 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 I have to have this kind of fully deterministic picture. But you did make a good point with also, well, one issue with prediction uh, in the context. And I didn't use prediction uh, explicitly either for the reason that you made. Namely, we do not have a fully and well-defined uh, understanding of the system or the system in isolation, because this is precisely what I often think leads to these misconceptualizations of what the elements are and their interaction and the function we're describing. So this is uh, where, where it's much more of a kind of a, um, we have, why I kind of introduce it historical elements. So to what extent are certain functions and systems also historically bound to the technologies in our current understanding of the system? Um, for instance, I do think that there's a lot of things to be changed with understanding of the census that we currently can't do. Uh, when it comes to what are the capacities of a system, how is it usually working, and how could we um, look at them in a broader sense. So I, I, I substantiate that with cyborg sensors. To what extent can we do technological appliances, certain kind of new tools to play with the kind of capacities of, of our existing sensors to create sensations building on the causal mechanism. That would change our understanding of what kind of a system, for instance, vision is, what kind of a system or faction is, because it's not bound to a particular sensory expression if we add new tools to it. But it would still go down to, we need to understand what's going on on a, on, a, on a, and I'm sorry for saying lower level, I just do this for illustration. So bringing it back, I don't think we need to have a fully well-defined understanding of a system. I think this is, I agree with you, we do not have that, but that's not for me a case not to apply the notion of uh, reductive explanations to in avoidance of the isms. Um, and the other thing is also, I do not think we have to have a complete description prior to having reductionism, but rather reductionism might help us to actually figure out to what extent we do not have actually a good understanding of what the elements are. So it's it's kind of I'm trying to turn this this whole thing around. Can I jump in? Yeah. Um, okay. I know. Um, <laughs> again, so I mean, I have, I have, uh, there's so much to talk about. We're going to have to catch up, Anne. Um, but I mean, for the audience, I think it's useful. First of all, I want to extend um, an olive branch. And I'm not sure if it's going to be, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if I have a bat in the other hand or a weapon of some kind. We'll see um, because I'm focusing the on the olive branch. The thing is, this strategy is where the olive, if, if you're trying to, if you're trying to sneak up on me, you shouldn't tell me, oh, by the way, what I have in my other hand is. <laughs> well, no, it's just, it's just, there, there might, well, I, we'll see. Okay. So first of all, um, I find it, I, I love the answers that you give because, uh, you know, in discussion and whatnot, uh, there is so much more, you, you can reveal so much more nuance to your position. And I wanted to invite everyone um, to think about, in fact, um, uh, you know, how well your account of, of ruthless reduction, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll come back to the ism. I think that's the part that might be a little bit thorny. Um, because I do think it matters. But I mean, the rest of your work that you've done in uh, sort of at the borderline between philosophy and science is, is just does so much, at least for me to contextualize what you want to say about ruthless reduction, right? So I mean, you talk about the, um, the, uh, the role of failure in science in some of your other papers, right? You talk about the role of discovery. And you know, it's, it's, 
Uh, none of this is like some kind of deterministic system where we just uh, can essentially be replaced by computers and whatnot. Rather, these are deeply, you know, material systems that are limited in, in so many different capacities. And, you know, we can nonetheless, given all these things, you know, do a lot of work by taking a ruthless, ruthlessly reductive approach. Um, and in that sense, I absolutely applaud your, your sub project here of wanting to redefine reductionism. That is precisely the type of progressive project that, that has something you know, that's, that's fruitful and has much potential for the future. Um, nonetheless, and I'm noticing that it's, it's, much, it's very positive and it's just once again, this little nitpicky pedantic thing that might grow into something bigger is with respect to this ism stuff, I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's merely verbal because I mean, it's it's via this way of articulating things that other things uh, seem to be triggered, right? So um, when we talk about reductionism, or we talk about essentially almost any ism, I'll, I'll say this in, in quickly in two parts. So uh, the first part of the ism stuff is that it's very, very often. Uh, 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 connected to some kind of, and I'm going to use the F word here, fundamental, something fundamental, right? That is the F word. And uh, th when you say reductionism, this, is, this goes hand in hand with this sort of exclusionary view that if we want to look at the lower level, this is to the exclusion of higher putative levels, and so to speak. And that's clearly not what you're advertising, right? That's, that's the one problem with reductionism. Um, the other part, and this is just kind of anecdotal, but I, I offer it for you for reflection, is when, uh, and given that, given what I just said, I use isms in my work as well, but uh, when I say an ism in my work, then I am explicitly committing to stuff that I will answer with, you know, as F word types of, uh, you know, discussions go, fundamental discussions with fists on the table. It's just that we, dis we, we, di we disagree in principle about something, right? But this is why I use the isms in a much more careful way to, to, to say like, I'm, I'm committed to materialism, for instance. And by that, and, and by virtue of that, I explicitly mean to exclude other positions like panpsychism and stuff like that, right? So, I mean, I see your point, but I, I want to push you a little bit more because I mean the way we talk and the things that you know our terms the way our terms can be interpreted, it does matter. Luis, you're uh, you're muted. Pragmatically and in, in, in a less scholarly manner, I can just say that uh it's it's detrimental to, to the point that you want to make. I mean you, you you're just gonna you, you might create so much confusion that the, the, the really important points that you want to bring will get submerged from distract there would be distraction like as you saw like there was a lot of distraction to so to speak from your standpoint you might have seen confusing but it, it's just that you either have a project in which you want to expand the idea that reduction needs to be understood in now now in a novel way given that we have thought about these things for 60 to 70 years now how can we think about it moving forward? That's fine. But given that it exists in a context in which it, it, it has so much attached to it, it, it can, at the very least, it can just lead to a lot of confusion as to even not understanding what your points are. Uh, to, to jump, uh, sorry, Anne, I want to jump right on that point. And yeah, the I mean, case that's it. Point I just wanted to say that briefly. Oh, the case in point to what Louise is talking about, for instance, I think can be uh, built up very, very effectively by looking at who your compatriots are who share the label ruthless reductionism, right? I mean, like you look at John Bickle, and he is most definitely committed to a very, very hard position, right? Yep. I mean, he says the only genuine explanations are cellular and molecular, right? And I mean, for him, it's an ideology. I don't think reductionism is an ideology for you. I think it's, it's not a little bit different in the last period, I have to say. Okay, that, yes. that's also true. That's also true. But nonetheless, so it's, next it's time I the, the, the later John Bickle, like the early Wittgenstein and the late Wittgenstein is the early Bickle and the late Bickle. No, I mean, John actually also told me with a couple of things uh, he disagrees with me, um, um, not just in this paper, but also in, in, in another. But um, I actually quite like these kind of disagreements. Also, the ones where they're like, well, these are actually confusing because I do think precisely because of that kind of uh, disparity in understanding, we're having these discussions.
questions. Um, I agree that there's an importance of choosing words, uh, especially for these kind of positions. Um, that being said, why I'm not always committed, committed, and I think this is what's what's annoying a lot of people with, with some of my work, is that I do think I'm not committed to ideologies and positions. I'm trying to understand the problem. So, and I'm using whatever tools are available and are best addressing the problem. And so philosophers find this frustrating because that means that sometimes I use positions in the way in which um, for instance, it's it's required to. Oh, sorry, my, my my dog is super needy today. Uh, it Fine is required. Uh, well, yeah, no, I, I I can maybe I can show a pic just very quickly here. You see, there's really a dog, uh, and she's just like pet me, and this is going on the whole time. So I'm partly distracted. It's uh, she's distracting. Um, anyway, but uh, to 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 bring this back because I do think you're absolutely right. There is a need to think about words. I did choose reductionism um, intentionally. Not necessarily, I, and I also agree, it would have potentially clarified uh, also what Lewis said, to uh, think in relation to the history of reductionism. Uh, that could have explained a lot. In this context, I, I actually wanted to keep this particular paper at a minimum length. Um, I also then later saw the paper by Eric. Actually, that might be a fun thing to, to, to discuss actually in this group as well at some point, Eric Hochheim's paper on reductionism, because he does kind of a, he does do a similar approach of, okay, this is how reductionism was used. Maybe there's a good reason to rethink it today. I love this paper. And he, he sent it to me when when uh, uh, I gave a talk on reductionism. Well, it's like, I think we're on the same level here. Sorry, I cannot help but say the, the, the notion level. So I agree that there's much more to be explicated and especially to give a much more uh, in-depth account of uh, the, the historical change that's being undertaken here. That's not part of this paper, I agree. That needs to be done, I agree. So on that case, yeah. But I do not think that F is necessarily the, the fundamentals that necessarily the F word. I mean, there's also the code. <laughs> <laughs> if I, if no, I can I, say I, that, I, sorry. If I can no, say no, that, go ahead, I'm, go I'm, ahead. I'm writing a paper with John Beagle, um, <laughs> one of you, <laughs> on, <laughs> on the implication on neuroepigenetics for uh, mechanisms and uh, the role of the environment. And, um, can we you send this to me? Go along, uh, pretty well together. So I and I don't see John uh, publishing anymore on ruthless reductionism in that form. He talks more on meta scientific view or mind to, to molecule links and and their implications for our understanding. So I I, I think that it is true as Anne says there is a late beacon. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. it gets a little bit farther from the initial positions. Well, can you send the paper to me when it's when it's kind of done? Because I would like to read it. Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, we are almost ready for submission. So we will like to have some comments before. Awesome. I have to just say, I have to run very, very soon because uh, yeah. I've, I've got a meeting in the lab, actually. Uh, we're, we're, we're building, we're, we're setting up the olfactometer and I can't wait. And I might have to quickly <laughs> run because I can do it, but the dog likes to stop and sniff uh, and I'll take her with me quite often. But that what, means I yeah. have to actually... So oh, Danny one has very, one final pressing point. One final pressing point, which we can't cover now. This but, is the bad. And, this is the bad you warned me about. Like now is the point you're not going to answer to, and I'm leaving this online. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm just uh, no, no. I'm uh, no uh, because no, no. It's not. But there is, there are many, many words to be had between you and me on levels, right? So, yes. and I'll put it. I'll put it specifically. So you had two slides that I had opposite reactions to. One was uh, the, 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 the earlier one where you said, uh, this invites us to revisit our assumptions, the elements, uh, blah, 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 and the levels. And I was like, yeah, that's, it. that's precisely the kind of thing I'm trying to get at. And then the other one, which had this caricatured Oppenheim and Putnam layer cake with this, and, and, and here's, here's the provocative part, with these bizarre combination of, of authors like Jaguan Kim and uh, Lepore and Louver and then Bickle, whoa, 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 hold on. I mean, there's a lot to be said there. Um, uh, and that, that's it. So no, no shots fired. I'm just saying they're to be continued.
not to mention not to mention wait not to mention the issue that Anne brought up Mars uh, Mars framework and linked it to levels. So there's a lot of work to be done there. <laughs> there is. There is. <laughs> okay, fair, everyone. Fair enough. This fair was really fair. wonderful. <laughs> yes, let and, me and say, and Louis, sure thank to, you. To save it. No, no, of course. But and make sure to save it on your end, right? Because it broke here on my end. So I yeah. only have the first 45 minutes. So please. I've got the second part. Yes, uh, I'm going to save please. it and I'm going to put it uh, somewhere on the cloud and send you the link. Yeah, yes, um, please. Yes. Yes. And yes. also, and Antonella, I'll, thank I'll... you so much for your comments. Thanks for, for your interesting paper to discuss. And thanks to Luis for the invitation. And oh, I no, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and it, was, it was really great. It was really a okay. pleasure. Yeah. And, and so really go further into philosophy. Well. This much. is, this is uh, as you can see, we, 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 it's, it's kind of blending more and more philosophy and neuroscience. But Dan, also good to see you. <laughs> you too, Bye, Anne. everyone. And save it. Please make sure to save it. <laughs> yes. Bye, have, a lovely, have a lovely weekend soon. Bye -bye. You all.